Our neighborhoods also continue to be segregated as anyone who lives in New York City, whether permanently or if you're here for the summer, knows just from experience. And we have made progress in neighborhood segregation over the past century. Um, in the middle of the 1900s, about 20% of all neighborhoods in urban areas were totally white. And that is something that now is virtually eradicated. But that doesn't mean that we've reached the place where we have integrated neighborhoods everywhere. And in fact, there are also issues that come in when you factor in economics. We now have more census tracts in America that have concentrated poverty than ever before. So we're having a conversation tonight really about how we got to this place in our country, but also about what we can do moving forward. And I'm just so thrilled and grateful that LaRue and Stephanie are both joining us, and I'm really looking forward to talking with them. And I also want to get a sense of who we have in the room with us and give you all a first couple of questions to jog your thinking. So I want everyone to just take a minute and think about the neighborhood where you grew up and the elementary school that you attended. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that you're going to answer subjectively. So just go with your gut feeling. But by raise of hands, who here thinks that they grew up in a neighborhood that was racially integrated? How about racially isolated or racially segregated? Think about the elementary school that you went to. Who thinks that you would consider that a racially integrated elementary school? Okay, how, how about racially isolated? Okay. Now I want you to think about the opportunities that you have today. And raise your hand if you think that those opportunities have been affected by the neighborhood that you grew up in. Okay, how about the school that you attended? Okay. How about if you think that the opportunities you have today, for better or worse, were affected by your race? Yeah. So it's really interesting. We have something of a mix of folks who lived in integrated, or they call them isolated neighborhoods and schools. Um, I saw a little bit more hands in both cases for neighborhoods that were racially isolated and schools that were racially isolated. Um, and I'm also really struck at the end that we have a group here that uh, really the vast majority of us, I think, are thinking about ways in which our opportunities have been shaped by those neighborhoods, those schools, and our own backgrounds. So I think that's an important grounding as we go forward. And I hope that you'll be thinking of questions that you have for us, um, because we'll have a chance to bring those in throughout. So to start, LaRue and Stephanie, I want to just frame a big question about how we got to this place. More than 60 years after Brown v. Board, we still have so many schools and neighborhoods that are racially divided. What policies and what trends have contributed to that? And tell us a little bit about the work that you do touching on those issues. First off, yeah. So um, I, by way of background, I'm from Chicago, the south side of Chicago. Um, I think I study neighborhoods, uh, families, and schools. And so I think it's great to have these opening questions to you know, situate um, you know, where we have all come from, where we are, and, and where we think we're going. Uh, I study the intersection between family life and the social policies that either impede uh, their well-being or facilitate their well-being. Um, I think that one of the things that always surprises my students, both undergraduate and graduate students, is how much the racial segregation we see in our neighborhoods and schools really does come from our, um, our housing, our housing policy, our housing market. Right? So housing has often been ignored. We think of neighborhoods, we think of schools, but we don't always think of housing units. Of course we do when we're paying rent or when we're you know, <laughs> looking to buy a house. But what's interesting, I, I, you know, I find, is that in, in going back a few decades, the, the, the linchpin in many ways is segregation in some of our, our inner city neighborhoods. It goes back to either the lack of, of housing policy or housing policy that specifically uh, served to separate whites from blacks. So 
One thing, you know, when thinking about schools is thinking about how connected they are to housing because we know that in the United States, despite an increasing array of choice options, most children still attend public school uh, that's zoned for their neighborhood. So one idea I just want to put out there is to think about that deep connection. Um, and I think that, you know, we also have, until recently, there's been some re recent activity in the courts around housing. But when we look back at, uh, at, at court cases that had to do with school desegregation, housing was never centrally considered. Mm -hmm. Right, so we, um, you know, it was often thought of as one of these market forces that we couldn't intervene, and it's something very private, you know, the private decisions of citizens about where they want to live. We can't intervene there, but by thinking we could intervene in schools without intervening in housing, right, that was a huge mistake, right? And, and some people think that that's really, you know, what was what made some of the um, the legacy of Brown uh, diminish some of the legacy of Brown by not really taking seriously housing uh, in, in, the, in the role that it plays in perpetuating educational inequality and the segregation of our schools. Yeah, uh, I would add to that from a more school-centered side. When I think about Brown versus Board of Education, most of us know the saying, separate facilities are inherently unequal, right? The idea that schools should be desegregated. And what's important is that while that declaration was monumental on a legal front, the application of desegregation did not happen as many people suspected. Right after that decision in Brown 2, when the question was asked of how quickly should schools be desegregated, the answer was with all deliberate speed, which means, well, you know, when you get to it, you know, it'll happen, right? Um, and what we had is a real large abstract endorsement of a, of a change around race and opportunity. Many people, if you come up to them and say, hey, do you believe that children should go to high-quality schools? Yes. Do you think that children should be segregated by race? No. Do you think that um, everyone should have the same opportunities you did when you were coming up? Yes. Right. And then we ask them, well, are you willing to send your child to a school that looks different than the school that you attended? In the abstract, sure. Right. But when people start to make decisions about schooling, they turn into um, almost every parent carries the same concern for their individual child. They become self-interested. And the choices that are made often reify the inequality we have. So schools don't become less segregated. Instead, folks say, well, I worked hard all my life. I was able to save up money to buy this house on Long Island. Right? And so why should I pay my tax dollars so that my child can go to a school in Long Island that I've been working on, and other kids who have not paid the same tax dollars have access to that school? that tension between the abstract and the concrete and the public and the private comes to a head. Many people still abstractly endorse desegregation, but when it comes to asking what do you do with your kids, it's really recreating what we already have. And as we're thinking about the policy context and looking at trends in housing and education, I'm also just struck by um, how, what, where we see connections with race relations in our country more generally, and particularly in what has been such a poignant um, year of so many tragedies deeply rooted in racism, and even this week with questions around the death of Sandra Bland, and um, I know that, Stephanie, you've done work looking at the death of Betty Gray and the shooting of Charleston race lately. As we're thinking about the state of race relations in our country, where do you see uh, the patterns of segregation coming into that conversation? Well, I think one idea I want to float out there, and I'm curious to hear what you all think about it during Q&A and, and, and after, is you know, I think what we, we, we have a chicken egg problem, right? So partly, one of the reasons it's difficult to move forward is because we do live separate from each other, which means that, you know, um, we're strangers to each other, right? When we have whites, blacks, Latinos living primarily in their own separate neighborhoods, um, we, we, we don't know each other very well, right? So we're left then vulnerable to sources of relatively low quality information about each other, right? <laughs> um, we're, you know, stereotypes as well, you know, it's a, it's a default. Um, or the 24 hour news cycle, where it seems to me, having been in Baltimore during the you know, the, the day that people are calling the riot or the uprising, right, things were being reported so quickly, mm -hmm. right, that, that often the, the information was misleading. Um, but, but, you know, uh, we're busy, people are overtaxed, so we take the, the, um, the quickest sources of information that we can, right, that are easiest for us to digest, 
and then and we run with that, right? So we're often left vulnerable to stereotypes and the, the turnaround of the, you know, the 24-hour media cycle. And what the media tends to do, right, is focuses on the most threatening, publicly aggravating aspects of inner city life. And if that's all we're getting, and that's all we know about what life is like on the other side of the tracks, and that's scary. Right, so then we're left to think of each other as threats one way or another. You know, in a world of finite resources, we're threats to each other. Right? And I think that comes from, in part, a history of us living separately and attending separate schools. And I think that you know, part of this is really thinking ab about how, how can we get better information out there? How do we get to learn more? Um, you know, I think that integration by neighborhood and schools is a critical uh, way to move forward. Not everybody agrees with that. Um, but I think part of the barrier has to do with, with you know, the fact that, it, by and large, we're, we're still strangers mm -hmm. to each other. Um, I want to agree with that in part and, and push it in a little different way, right? I think there is um, a dimension of strangeness and distance, right? But the role of power looms large. Mm -hmm. When you look at people's residential preferences, people of color are more willing to live in neighborhoods that are predominantly white uh, or mixed race, right? when the actual application oftentimes many white Americans do not opt to live in neighborhoods that are diverse, right? So we can be strangers in the abstract, we'd even have better information about who we are, but if our choices look similar, right? If lending practices look similar, if for middle income uh, African American <laughs> families they still receive predatory loans, mm -hmm. right? African Americans, as Camille Zabrinsky Charles has argued, are the only ethnic group that buy housing that is depreciating in value, right? If you can't gain access to the American dream in those ways, then still we'll have these very separate realities. When I think about what it says about race relations, um, uh, it actually takes me to McKinney, Texas, right? So before the Charleston shooting and before Rachel Dolezal, y'all remember how she took over the, 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 the internet and the world for a moment? Um, the, the, in McKinney, Texas, a pool party kind of typifies where I think we are, right? Um, in particular, it ended up being a videotaped assault on a number of African-American teenagers in a suburb, right? And this is literally a planned community, right? It's a master planned community, meaning it was designed to avoid many of the urban traps. But still in this moment of conflict at the pool party, it said that a white resident said to the black children, go back to where you came from, right? As if their residence in the suburb was not equal to hers. And when they said, I live here, she said, go back to Section 8 housing, right? So the perception of even incorporation, and, and this is where I make some distinctions in vocabulary. I often try to talk about segregation, desegregation, and integration. Segregation, we know, is um, the, the separation between two or more groups. Usually has a legislative history. It's now by practice. Desegregation is the leveling of those barriers, right? But you can have desegregation like that pool party, like that neighborhood in McKinney, but still not have integration. The social relationships between folks aren't close. You can be proximate and still distal. And oftentimes, we are looking at suburban communities that are dealing with that. The reason Ferguson, Missouri, and Michael Brown happened is that many African Americans moved out to Ferguson, and poverty has been suburbanizing, but the power structure over those suburbs hasn't shifted. So you're looking at people moving, but the attitudes and the distribution of power not shifting much at all. So I'm curious to dig into that distinction more, which I think plays out in both of your work in terms of what it actually takes to reach integration, the way you've laid it out, to, to successfully have not only opportunities to live and attend school together, but to access the same resources and same benefits in those situations. And I know, LaRue, you've looked at what can happen in schools that look as a whole like they're really integrated, but um, in fact, opportunities are very different. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I have to say, I realized that I, I did something wrong. I was probably the only person who didn't answer the question in the beginning, <laughs> right? Um, I did. And, and, it, and in part, I realized I was like, hmm, my answers just keep on changing. Yeah. Rather, they've evolved. They don't change anymore. But when I was younger, I probably would have said that I grew up in a neighborhood that was decently integrated, right? And then when I actually... As a sociologist, I do things like go back and look at my census tract when I was growing up and we calculate, all, all an, do that. <laughs> calculate an, an index of dissimilarity. And I was like, all right, so this is fairly desegregated. And then I was like, yeah, but there was like all this portion of the neighborhood was black. And then this street over here was white. And then I was like, yeah, but well, my school looked kind of 
also integrated. And then I realized, I was like, nah, there were a couple of black kids here. But then when you went to junior high school, then you went to high school, junior, uh, Catholic school in the city, and then it was predominantly black and Latino. And I started to realize that the things I had perceived in the midst of my growing up were very far from reality, right? which led me to the work that I, I do now. And I often study race. I often study class. But I do it in suburban schools. Um, I'm working on a project now in private schools. I want to know in those spaces that are thought of as ideal, right? does everyone get the spoils? Uh, I can tell you, sadly, the short answer is no. Right. Uh, we often have schools that have been desegregated at a level, but inside of them, there's a level of secondary segregation. Access to classes, and this starts as um, uh, early as elementary school. Right? We have some good work about upper school. But when I started to sit in classrooms and talk to families and talk to teachers and observe, I saw literally reading groups in which students of color were treated differently, their reading connections were devalued, right? And even the, uh, there was a moment in which I was watching a teacher who, for some reason, wasn't correcting African American students. And, I, and, and as I sat down to interview him, I said, well, um, tell me about some of your choices. And he said, you know, LaRue, there was a point in time when if I had a black kid come into my classroom and he said, uh, he had said something where there was a dangling preposition, like, where's it at? He would say, it's right behind that preposition. Um, and, and he said, but you know, LaRue, I think my kids are pretty savvy. And if they think that I don't like the way they talk, they may think I don't like the way their parents talk. And if I don't value them and their parents, they may perceive me as racist. So his response was to remove all correction, right? But ironically, he corrected white students, right? right? So you got an, uh, an unequal set of instructional relationships, right? where students are making errors, and under the guise of, in his mind, of being non-racist, right, he was actually endowing greater inequality. And that often happens in schools that we consider integrated because our goal has been get kids sitting next to each other. But the curriculums inside of schools haven't become dynamic or responsive. In fact, we've become more focused on the achievement gap than ever. So this notion of like cultural, uh, uh, culturally grounded teaching and understanding power dynamics within schools is kind of going out the window. As long as you can make adequate yearly progress, and as long as if you're in a state that marks grades, your grade isn't low, you're great. When in reality, you can have many high-flying kids, and many kids who are flying much lower, but we don't, uh, our analysis doesn't go down to that level. And Stephanie, I think there are some parallels in housing, and I know you've looked at both uh, housing programs that give low-income families an opportunity to move to neighborhoods with less poverty, some of which have been very successful, and then others that have had really disappointing results. So can you talk about some of those dynamics? Sure. Um, so just by way of background, uh, you know, I've been studying housing mobility and, and, and housing policy for over 20 years. And I started out, um, and it was no you know, by no um, a talent of, of mine that I got accidentally placed uh, with a research position with a, a, a professor at Northwestern, James Rosenbaum, um, who, who had taken the opportunity of a, a class action desegregation lawsuit and turn it into a research experiment. So this goes back to the 1960s in Chicago, the Chicago Gatreau case, uh, which, which was um, you know, a, a, a number of fair housing attor attorneys took the case on behalf of public housing residents living in, in the Chicago Housing Authority's properties and took it all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing right, that the policies of Chicago's Housing Authority and HUD had served to essentially segregate families who were using the public housing program in the, in the poorest, uh, most isolated and racially segregated neighborhoods in Chicago. And, um, and so the, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the plaintiffs won. And the remedy in this case, and this is me, um, I'm not a lawyer, I play one sometimes on TV, <laughs> um, learning that the remedy to this case was the provision of uh, 7,000 housing vouchers to be used to help African American families, it was strictly a race-based uh, program, a move to revitalizing neighborhoods in the Chicago, in, in the city of Chicago, or a mostly white, non-poor neighborhoods in the suburban, the seven suburban counties around Chicago. So um, I can't take credit for having been around or born when this program first started. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, some, some of the best things that happened in life are serendipity, right? Um, it was uh, when I got to graduate school in the late 90s that families had moved 15 to 20 years earlier through this program. And my advisor had started to follow them and looked at some early outcomes for the, for the uh, mostly moms and children uh, in, in Gautreaux. And by the time I showed up, 
you know, all eager to get to work uh, in graduate school, it was right, you know, the data was ripe for the picking. And so we followed a random sample of 1,500 of these families to figure out where they were living 15 to 20 years later and look at some of their educational outcomes, some of the mom's employment outcomes. And what we saw at, the, at, at this stage was, was pretty transformative. I think most people didn't believe that these families would stay in what turned out to be mostly white communities, that they would return back to live with others who were, quote, like them. Um, that's where some of the, the critics, geographers and sociologists alike, had, had, had argued. But what, but what we found is that the majority of these families were still living in much less poor, much less segregated neighborhoods 15 to 20 years later. And then when their children became young adults, we saw similar results. They were attending much higher quality schools. And there's some small uh, evidence, some, some weak evidence, this isn't the strongest effects, that, they were, that, that moms were uh, receiving um, uh, unemployment at lower rates and were more likely to be employed and had slightly higher earnings. So this wasn't a full-blown experiment, okay, where you flip a coin, um, and I can talk about in a minute why that matters. But what it was was a, was a really important uh, shift in the way we think about what it takes to help people get ahead. Prior to the Gautreaux research, uh, you know, if you go back to the Great Society programs under Johnson, a lot of the focus was on human capital and skill acquisition. You know, people are poor because they don't have the skills that, they, that will be rewarded in the labor market. And while we know that's certainly true, um, part of what the early Gautreaux research suggests is it wasn't just who you were, but where you live that matters too. Right? That, that, that places have resources inherent to them and it really makes a difference independent of, of your own family background. And so this research opened a whole window um, into that. And, and since then, I mean, the you know, number of other scholars, you know, Will, William Julius Wilson, um, D Doug Massey, N N Nancy Denton, have done tons of groundbreaking work suggesting that this, this is precisely what you would see if, if we could get families who, were, who had grown up in these high poverty communities to have access to the same kinds of neighborhoods that their white and middle class counterparts had just always enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's some of the work that I've done. I won't, there, there's a number of other pro pro programs that I've studied that have followed the Chicago uh, program. One is the, the, uh, the increasingly famous moving to opportunity experiment, um, which was what happened after Gautreaux. Uh, HUD decided to scale this up because it looked, it looked successful and scaled it up into five cities. Uh, Baltimore um, was one of them, Chicago, LA, New York, and Boston. Um, so I can talk a bit more about that uh, a little later. Um, and that was a true randomized experiment, a flip of a coin and everything. Um, one of the highest profile social science experiments probably in history. And then more recently, I've been working on a case in Baltimore that was um, modeled much like that early Chicago Gautreaux case, that Baltimore um, a ho public housing residents uh, took the Housing Authority of Baltimore City and HUD to court, arguing that they had also been essentially trapped into, into uh, racially isolated ghetto neighborhoods and that there wasn't a, an, a regional um, opportunity to find housing. And so that's some more recent work that I've done. Um, but this, you know, sort of what tells us is, is one, right, from a sort of a, a, a social science point of view, what's possible if, if people have access to better schools, safer neighborhoods, but they're not panicked at night wondering what's going to happen if they walk out the door, what's going, what, what, you know, will bullets fly through windows, literally. You know, what if, what if we were able to give parents and their children the kinds of places that allow them to be better parents and better children? Right, so that kind of change, we, we get to see that through some of these housing interventions, and it also tells us how we might better leverage some of our existing policies. It doesn't answer all questions, and it certainly isn't the answer to all of our urban, our questions about urban inequality, but, but um, certainly learn quite a bit. So I want to ask a big question that for me comes out of what both of you have said. So on the one hand, we know that it can make a huge difference for a family to have a chance to move to a neighborhood with less poverty, on the other hand, we know that there are suburban schools that where, um, although they're integrated overall, the um, outcomes and opportunities for children are still extremely shaped by their individual background and their race. So what does equity look like? And is there a way to have equity within segregated neighborhoods and segregated schools? Is integration a path to equity? Does equity mean that we don't consider race, or does it mean that we actually consider race even more? Um, easy so, question. Yeah, so. easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, acknowledging first that it's complicated. 
it's important that we have an orientation not just towards equity, but for me, more justice, really, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When we look at the history of housing segregation, uh, it is absolutely linked to federal lending, it is linked to redlining, it is linked to all so sorts of things that have created a disparate world, right? We have to do something intentional to offset that, right? If we are to give the same opportunities or provide the, and, and use a more colorblind or race neutral language of everyone gets the same now, if somebody has $800 and someone has 20 and we give everybody 50, that's still 850 to 70, right? We, we often pat ourselves on the back because we move towards um, giving the same policy treatment now in 2015, but we've kind of been struggling with this since about 1619, right? So if we orient ourselves towards justice, then we have to first say we have to do something, um, and Stephanie, I'm going to let you take this later, um, we have to do something about housing, right? We have gotten more and more into conversations about schools that have eliminated housing. Our narrative around schools now have said, except segregation. It's just inevitable. Like, it's there. So we're going to find segregated, high-poverty schools that have no excuses, that emphasize grit, that are high-flying, right? And they have to do an impossible, Herculean task, and we have done nothing about disturbing the social order. So we can't do that. Um, we know those schools uh, that even the ones that get profiled one year, the next year, well, they fall off the map for a reason. Uh, so we have to uh, attack housing, but we also have to go to these spaces where the compositions have changed, but the power structure hasn't. Right? So I think one of the important things that came out of uh, Mike Brown and Ferguson in an investigation of Ferguson was the way in which the municipality was taxing black and brown folks and low-income folks, getting a disproportionate share of the tickets, right? Literally, the weight of the city was on their back, and people would not notice. This is happening all over. What suburban districts have done is they found a way to make those who have arrived to them or are perceived to be new arrivals, right? Because many suburban places have had people of color for a long time. They've just never been fully incorporated as citizens. They've taken, uh, they've taken in more people but given them less power to control their schools, less power to have influence. And so they move from one situation that is terrible to simply a bad situation. If there isn't an emphasis from the federal government as well as local institutions saying that the power structure of these communities has to look something similar. Right? I, you, can, you can almost pick up districts in Long Island and all of the children look one way and the leadership looks another. Not to say just because someone looks like you it's a panacea, but we have to recognize that there's a connection to how we deal with folks who have shared experience. Our governance has gone away from shared experience. We have shared governance, but very little shared experience. So I think about equity, um, you know, it brings to mind the idea of, um, you know, of, of the relationship between equity and freedom, right? And this taps a little bit into, into um, you know, what we we're talking about. But I, I think, uh, you know, the, one of the uh, levers we use to try to make things equal in, in this country is to, is to employ choice, um, you know, whether it's in housing or schools, right? So Americans don't like anything to get in the way of their choices. Right, whether it's at the store or you know for their children's schools or or, or housing, um, you know, and uh, I think so what some people might argue is value, you know, that we value about the United States is it's it's the freedom that we have, right? That that you know, and if we go even back to John Stuart Mill, you know, and on liberty, right? That the idea that well, the best kind of society is, society is a society that doesn't let anything get in the way of people's choices and people's preferences, right? That we're able to make these choices and freely express our preferences. But there's a problem there, right, in that not everybody's preferences and choices were developed under the same circumstances. But a little, in a, a little known um, nerdy sidebar, right, Mill actually wrote another book later on on uh, representative government where he said, well, you know, it turns out that the state does sometimes need to intervene. In the case where, you know, preferences were developed under oppression. At times, we need the state to intervene, which is not the, the typical hands-off libertarian approach that's attributed to him. <laughs> but that it, you know, at times, right, in order for there to be true choice, we need to intervene. Um, and I think we saw that right in the in the wake of Brown, um, as Larue said, we we you know there it wasn't enough just to say we have we believe that separate is not equal. Uh, we have to enforce that. And one of the approaches to doing that was was were choice plans, you know, open choice plans at schools system said, well, you can choose the white school or choose the black school. 
um, in, in, the, in, in the case in 1968 in Green versus the County Board of Education, they said, well, choice plans aren't necessarily, you know, aren't necessarily going to, um, uh, you know, answer the mandate of Brown, right? Because how do people make choices? Sometimes they make choices because uh, under fear, right, or lack of information or lack of experience to expect black families to make the decision to go to the white school was unrealistic and, and um, you know, that's not real freedom, that's not mm -hmm. real choice. And I think that part of what, you know, this makes me think about is, you know, um, you know how we, we, we have to be vigilant, right? So there's a justice point that also came up. So if I take my social science hat to the side, it's not far away, and put my um, social justice hat on, and this comes from years of working alongside incredible heroes of fair housing. Um, Alex Polakoff, who, who worked the Chicago case to the Supreme Court, and all of the attorneys that just took um, the disparate impacts case to the Supreme Court, uh, always say, well, you know, outcomes are one thing. And just because we, we have an intervention and, and the people who uh, had previously been denied opportunities can't prove they, they did better after they got those opportunities, should they not have had them in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's different ways to think about it that are really complicated, right? So, you know, if, if we, do we have to prove that giving access to, um, you know, to, to housing everywhere, is that is going to make the dropout rate go down for, for young people and these families? Is, you know, so there's social justice questions and then there are questions about what is the most effective way to increase or de decrease inequality and increase social mobility. So these are some of the different things I think about. There's some, some of the complications and problems. We, so what's equity? You know, is equity freedom? Is equity being vigilant to make sure that people who had previously been denied things now have those? Or is it going all the way to the outcomes and say, well, it wasn't just the opportunity we provided, but we were vigilant enough to see it through to the end? Can, can I add something really quickly? For yeah, one and, oh. and let me give a quick uh, shout to the audience that we're going to start incorporating questions. So if you have one, get ready. Um, Stephanie made me think about like the choice and the equity thing uh, and one of the things that I think because we're so <laughs> attached to choice but we're attached to choice with an assumed quality right no, everybody wants a choice of good things if I gave you all the bad stuff to choose from you'd be like no right? <laughs> right. so I think that there's a way that sometimes Americans can fall back from choice when there's high quality and in schools there are a couple examples of things that I think can work towards this, that get us towards justice um, and not choice. One is out of North Carolina, Project Bright Idea, right? The, which is an emphasis on a curriculum that is college preparatory, right, um, and advanced. It says, who are the kids who are advanced? All of you, right? We're gonna make sure we have a curriculum that pushes you to the limits and also has scaffolding throughout, right? So it's really like, uh, um, it, they're continuing to grow into a, a much more full-scale curricular intervention in multiple cities. But what they found is that in terms of at the secondary level, they're getting much more equitable enrollment in more advanced placement classes, right? Because they still have AP classes because you got to apply to college, right? But they're seeing folks from different groups enrolling in them in, in much more in, in numbers that reflect their distribution. They're also finding that the gap between students is closing steadily. While in most schools, as you go, the gap widens. And Project Right Idea, um, in places it holds steady and it closes, which is like huge. What happens is sometimes we get so wrapped up in choice and making our kid different, we miss out that that choice you had actually wasn't even a good choice. It didn't get them as far as they need. And we are used to, uh, when, I, when I talk to folks about tracking and ability grouping, how many of y'all went through schools where tracking was present? Right. Um, many of us have gone through schools where tracking is present and we're like, yes, it works even though most of the research evidence says, bad idea. For who? Everybody. Right. So we have to do something where we reorient ourselves away from choice, but also towards the things that we desire, even if the solution seems unconventional. Yeah. Great. We'll take a question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to just piggyback on what you were just talking oh, about. Oh, actually, I'm going to ask you one second, because we have folks in the webcast. So. Yes. I'd like to just um, ask you a further question about what you were just talking about in terms of tracking and in terms of uh, this idea that all students can uh, eventually go to college and have AP classes. Uh, New York City has sort of done something like that and it hasn't worked out uh, in that now we're finding out that we need vocational schools because everybody isn't getting 
the same education. Everybody isn't responding to education in the same way because of, uh, in a, a lot of ways, much of the dysfunction that they're coming from, they're bringing into the schools. And unfortunately, the schools are not prepared and they're not ready yet to handle those students and deal with the issues that they have to deal with in order to get them ready to study. So how, how, do, how does this um, issue that you were talking about, how are they dealing with that and coming up with success? Okay, so to backtrack, right? Um, knowing New York schools pretty well, I can definitely tell you New York schools has not done this, right? We have ratcheted up the idea of folks being, as nationally, there's a conversation about college ready and college prepared. Right. Everyone's college ready and college prepared, right? Ad nauseum. I get it. What that means, we're not sure. Right? right? Well, we got common core. Well, yeah, yeah. Just get ready. Right. <laughs> what, <laughs> what New York has done and continues to do is leave the same school structures in place, right? So we know that the large schools have now been broken up, right? But we also have to recognize when those large schools are broken up, uh, even for the large schools that remain, there is still a funding gap. We have the Campaign for Fiscal Equity in New York, which said there are X amount of dollars that are meant to be uh, inputted to offset. And those large schools still have a gap of about $4,000. Oh, wait, what are we doing about it? Oh, there was a budget crisis a couple years ago, and we just haven't paid that down. So A, we haven't seen appropriate inputs to begin with. B, the school structure has allowed the specialized schools to continue to cream, right? To take the best students, to take students that don't look like a representation of New York City, right? So we haven't dis disturbed, we haven't provided for the big schools. The big schools that divided got uh, take, uh, changed into boutique schools or smaller schools, right? A misinterpretation of research. The schools that um, have been middling have remained exactly where they are. The schools on the lower end of the distribution, this reintroduction of a conversation about vocational education. One, I think vocational education is hugely important if it is not a place where you're dumping folks. Right, right, right. We talk about vocational education in New York like a dumping ground. These kids can't behave. These kids aren't on time. You know what they need? A trade. It's almost like we just got plopped down in 1935, right? <laughs> Realistically, there are many ways in which um, students I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to walk with me for a second. Students who come to school want to learn. Oftentimes, there are challenges associated with learning. Maybe your life. Schools that have arrangements that actually work with students where they are. Schools that aren't heavy on penalizing and suspending students. Uh, schools that actually have processes for working with kids. They find those children aren't necessarily the ones who are going to vocational schools, right? Which again demonstrates we're using vocation as a dumping ground. We need more responsive schools that are attached to communities. New York City has simply said, we have schools. And we have some really good schools. So you should go to Brooklyn Tech right. and Bronx Science. Or if you're in the Upper East Side, you should go to private school. Right. We have zip codes in New York where 83% of the kids go to private schools. So New York has not done virtually anything like North Carolina. So there's a lot we could do. So I, I want to bring it back to um, a parallel in housing too and Stephanie you alluded a little bit to what happens in moving to opportunity so in education you know we have these gold standard programs that are really doing a great job of bringing students of all backgrounds to these um, high levels of achievement challenging curriculum a district like New York might say they're doing some of that but it's really not the same and I feel like we've seen some of this parallel in housing in terms of programs Everyone saw that Gautreau had these fantastic results, so let's do it in moving to opportunity. And then the results were disappointing. So what are the elements that shape whether something is wildly successful um, or really a disappointment? So um, I, it's a, I think that's a really, um, it's an interesting set of questions I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, one thing I wanted to say before answering that is, is the question of vocational education is one I hope we can return to. Please, yes, um, yes because I just, just to plant a seed for you to think about, um, you know, we have to come to terms with the fact that our college graduation rate has stagnated since mm -hmm. the 1970s. And when I'm in Baltimore City's neighborhoods talking to our poorest kids, almost exclusively of color in these neighborhoods, they want to go to work immediately. A four-year college is basically abstract to them, with a few exceptions, which are the choice magnet schools. Um, so we have a, a, a set of issues we need to think about, you know, in terms of how we want to prepare our young children to move forward. Is college for everyone? 
Um, if we did vocational education, um, you know, how would we do it? Are we doing it well? What would it look like? What are some promising practices? And then we have to think about what kind of labor market we're releasing them into, and and, and can that can that provide a livable wage? So that's a conversation. That sort of, I'd love to get back into. Um, in terms of thinking about housing programs, so the Gatro intervention I worked on, um, you know, really caught the attention of of the housing the the Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD. And so that's what led to, uh, in the 1990s, a number of things came together, including um, you know, this, the, re the report of the, the, the National Commission on Severely Distressed Housing uh, in 1992, um, you know, on, on the heels of the, the, work, the great work that, that William Julius Wilson had done and, and also Massey and Denton. There was a convergence of, of thought at that time, right, that if we were to help families leave some of these distressed neighborhoods, um, we, you know, we, we could really change their lives. Um, you know, this is also around the time that the Hope Six program was born, uh, which was the program that's better known as the one that tore down all the high-rise public housing and then most of it disappeared um, or was vouchered out and we don't really know what happened to some of the other families, right? So that's, um, you know, what all, all happened around the same time. So when MTO, which is the Moving to Opportunity Experiment, we call it for short, um, uh, that, so just to take a step back in case, um, uh, just to make sure folks understand that the design wasn't, was a lot like what you'd expect from a medical trial where someone gets a placebo sugar pill and someone gets a treatment, right? So there was a flip of a coin and, and poor families in public housing signed up for a chance to get a voucher to be used in a low poverty neighborhood. Um, and so one, one third of the families got this voucher with some housing counseling one third of the families got a regular Section 8 voucher. They're now called housing choice vouchers. Uh, and one third of the families got no voucher but were followed over time. This was the research design. Um, and this, this program was launched, uh, it, Congress appropriated money for this in 1993, uh, about $70 million um, to, to fund MTO in five cities. And the families, their fortunes were followed over, under the microscope, all right, for about 10 years. Uh, and, I, and I was, uh, by just again another stroke of good luck, got a job in Baltimore, uh, which happened to be one of the, one of the uh, moving to opportunity sites. So uh, originally, you know, everyone thought, well, a miracle will happen. You know, everybody's lives will change if they leave some of these um, 40 plus percent poor neighborhoods. Um, and in some ways it did for some families. Um, some of the earliest and most surprising results, surprising to some of the researchers who designed the program, but maybe not surprising to any of us who's ever spent time in, in one of the old high-rise projects, is that mom's mental health improved on par with best practices and antidepressant medication therapies. No one even thought actually to include that originally in the study. It was an accident that some of the economists came, up, uh, came, came upon um, doing some pilot work. And it turned out that the biggest results, at least up until a few months ago, was on mental health for moms and daughters. Um, you know, and again, thinking about this, um, it may not be a surprise, considering how toxic some of these environments were. We created a, ge you know, a generation of some of the most damaged families in America by housing them in these vertical ghettos. To leave them was such a relief. In fact, we, I witnessed over the last 12 years of field work, some, uh, some of, of the parents just stopped using drugs just, after, just because they left the high rises. Um, it was such a powerful experience and became better parents because they had a chance to be, you know, in a safer neighborhood and, and, and didn't have to focus on um, fighting off addiction and, and, um, and, all, and violence. But so, you know, and, and what's interesting to me, Hallie, is I always think about that result kind of getting swept under the rug mm -hmm. at first in favor of the more negative results that said, well, test scores didn't improve, mom's employment outcomes didn't improve, boys seem to get in more trouble when they move to low poverty neighborhoods. And I always think, you know, if one of the pharmaceutical companies had these results, it would have been considered a wild success. Mm -hmm. But because we took a group of, of low income families of color, and gave them some subsidies and hoped that they would do a whole bunch of things like get, get you know, work more often or earn more money, you know, that they felt better and had started to get a new lease on life, it wasn't valued. This is something that's always bothered me. So, um, you know, and, and it really says a lot about what we value and what we expect the payoff to be when we invest in human beings. But that aside, um, so the results were a bit disappointing at first. And part of that had to do with the way that the, that the program uh, played out. The, the, um, it turns out, right, in these five cities, Chicago, New York, Boston, LA, and Baltimore, you still had to deal with housing discrimination, right? So pa families were, were given a voucher and a little bit of help to try to find affordable housing in low poverty neighborhoods. This is not the easiest thing to do. You really need a lot of help 
to try to find these units. And that, and, and MTO didn't quite have the, the support and resources it needed to accomplish this. So about half the families in the, quote, experimental group didn't even lease up. And those who did, most moved to less poor neighborhoods, but they were often still racially segregated and still in the same low-performing school district mm -hmm. when they started. Uh, over two-thirds um, of, of the families in most of these cities were still in a, a low-performing school district. Uh, so there were certainly some implementation challenges, one of which is our racially segregated housing market. Right? So you had an intervention sort of overlaid on a challenging uh, geography of opportunity that's skewed in favor um, uh, of, of some people and not others. Um, an interesting thing happened, though, in, in, in the last few months, an economist that some of you might have heard, um, uh, Raj Chetty, got some IRS data and was able to, to um, which is an incredible feat, right? It's really difficult to get this kind of data. Um, and uh, was able to match earning a whole host of, of long, long-term outcomes for the children who were part of the MTO program as they became adults. Um, and looking at earnings and, uh, and, um, and whether they got married and whether they attended college and found that there were actually huge effects. They just took a little bit of time mm -hmm. to show up. And they didn't show up the way we might have thought. And, and you know, I mean, these were pretty big effects for the young, young people who, who were, um, the, 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 the youngest were zero, about zero to seven when they first, uh, their families first got the, the voucher, experienced a, an increase in income of about $3,000 relative to the control group. It's almost a third of an incre increase in income. It's huge. And so everybody now, of course, says, oh, well, neighborhoods matter again. <laughs> <laughs> so for a long time, those of us who knew fair housing, um, housing quality, neighborhood safety and violence, all these things really affect the way families function, the way children learn. Right? We, were, we were left having to defend our position until the experiment showed these, these positive results again. And we can talk a bit more about, about all of the things that happened in between. But, um, but I think that there were definitely some implementation challenges there. Um, and why the needle moved on earnings and college attendance later on, but not test scores early on is an interesting question. Um, and um, there's a, a program in Baltimore that I've been studying now for about 10 years that did this intervention much, much better, actually, and is yielding much larger gains, both in neighborhood and school quality. And we're about to release a report um, in the next few weeks showing some gains in children's test scores who left Baltimore's inner city and, and relocated to higher quality schools. Which again tells us not about the only way, you know, the only tool in our toolkit for how we deal with urban inequality, but tells us something about what happens when people live in environments that are safer and have more resources and allow them to be the people they want to be. But I think a really key issue here and drives, it motivates my work and I'm sure most of you in the room is, is how do we tap into human potential? Right? Let, how, do we, how do we convince, uh, you know, critics and, um, and, and naysayers and, and, you know, and, and maybe white families who don't want to live in integrated neighborhoods, how do we convince, you know, uh, the public that it's worth investing in human potential? How do we do that? Uh, because I think it's, it can be transformative. Yeah. We'll take another question from the audience. This one up here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how um, government policy could influence the private sector to believe in investing in human potential. Because this whole conversation is about policy, <laughs> understandably, since you guys both, uh, this is your area of study. But if people make more money, uh, it, it, that seems like it's a real game changer on the, on the outcomes. If people have access to uh, health insurance that covers mental health issues, mm -hmm. That's a huge factor in um, addressing the problem in the environment where people are. You know, I think the question of money also, you know, plays out in gentrification. You might see in Brooklyn, people who can't afford to live here are, are moving to that part of, the, of town and changing it dramatically because of the amount of income that, and uh, earning potential they have access to. And then I think that also, you know, how people make money, the college education doesn't necessarily get you the right. income it would have before. Wage stagnation has a lot to do with the private sector. So I guess the question of anything you can add about, about how people's income and how they get access to income like influences these outcomes would be interesting to me. Um, uh, I don't have a good poker face. And my mind went five <laughs> places <laughs> first, right? Um, and I was thinking about how sometimes there can be an investment from the private sector into education that is supposed to have a return to investment, but they're very selective. 
It's got to look like the right set of schools, right? It's rarely something large scale, right? It's like, what is your particular charter network? Ah, yes, we can find, we can, we can find a way to invest in you. Um, and I think about in New York as, as a landscape, the schools that tend to get the most private dollars for improving education, which will link up to later life choices, are often the most uh, draconian. The ones which take students who are low income, brown and black, and have them walk on a straight line. Tell them when the speaker comes in, there is a proper way to sit. And undergirding that is a narrative of what folks like Paul Tuff and Jeffrey Canada have said are middle class values. Right? So it again attaches the notion that the issue is not poverty that folks are living in. The issue are the cultural values and the orientation of kids. I think if I were looking for private investments, I'd certainly look for folks who are shifting some of the actual terrain, uh, the, the geography of opportunity, not simply the schools, right? Because what I think the, the, the new investment strategy is now that we have uh, allowed public education to have privatized dimensions, it's strategic investment in those places where you can get real estate returns, where you can get certain, um, it's, it's, it's like uh, their social responsible uh, investing, right? It's window dressing, right? It's avoid the problem, but make sure you have enough on your portfolio so it looks good. So that was the thing, that was my visceral reaction. Doesn't answer your question. Right, right. don't pay anybody more. Absolutely not. Because the folks who are making the money, sorry, the folks that are making the appropriate money are in certain echelons. Those who we're investing in, those people still probably won't be able to work in the offices we have. They'll have to compete for low wage jobs that are continuing to disappear because they're not getting the internships that the students who are coming from the more selective schools are getting anyway. Do you want to say, or I want to, yeah. I want to wrap in a couple more audience questions and I'm looking at the time moving quickly. So um, I think we'll actually take um, two if we can and sort of give you guys the chance to respond to multiple ideas in there. Um, so we can do the two right here in the, in the aisles. Hi, so um, I was wondering for both the questions on education and on housing because I was a college admissions officer and now I'm a paralegal for housing and workers rights for a, law, a legal service law firm. Um, how does the idea of, or where do you find the balance between integration and also the value of shared communities? Uh, like thinking specifically for education and college admissions, there's this wonderful program called the Posse Program uh, where students are applying to college together, a group of minority students oftentimes applying to college together so that they have a network of friends who have the shared experience with them in their college experience. And there's a lot of value in that, but also still the importance of integration. Like, how do you balance those two items? And in regards to housing, the idea of Section 8 and voucher housing, sometimes plopping someone down in a community with no resources or picking them up from their roots and their community and the people who they know and plopping them into this new place where maybe they meet a lot of hostility. So how can policy uh, help balance those two dynamics? Great. I know there will be a lot of thoughts on that, but let's take one other question, too, to give us things. To I guess this is a kind of a systemic question. I was just wondering, I'm a teacher in the South Bronx, so I'm just wondering, there has to be a less arbitrary way of getting proper education for kids than just their zip code. Because like, I see kids that are in my classes and in other classes where I look at them and I'm like, you don't belong here. Like, you should be somewhere else. But they, and a lot of times their parents aren't savvy enough to navigate the system and know how to do certain things. So they're stuck in these areas. And I feel like a lot of them are prone to regression, where then maybe these people, we're talking about capital, maybe these students that were able to become something now regress because they see this environment that they're in and they feel there's no way out. What, what do you think are some options? What are some things that could be done besides just zoning of saying this is your zone school this is where you got to go so we've got integration and community and structural questions about uh, what it means how we decide which schools kids attend um, any pieces of those that you guys want to go to stephanie so um i'll try to take the first set of questions first and then we can sort of go back and forth a little bit um so i, I think that it it you know, you're right i mean we have to think about multiple approaches. And, and one of the things that, that happens is when I talk about some of the housing mobility programs that I study, people say, well, you know, what about every, you know, everyone that gets left behind? And I, I sort of, like I said before, I think one, one, one of the takeaways from that work is, is 
you know, if you want to learn how something matters, change it. And that's part of what we get to see in a, w a window into when we change neighborhoods and schools in such a radical way as, as some of the programs I've studied have done. Um, but then we have, to, we have to think about places. You know, I'm committed to Baltimore City. Um, I left Chicago for Baltimore and was miserable for three years. Um, it was so difficult to, to, to follow up that act, right? And then I fell in love with Baltimore, and the more, the more time I've spent there, the more I've started thinking about some of these questions. Uh, the problem is, is our evidence base on c community revitalization programs is a lot thinner than the evidence base on what happens when you give an individual family some money. The empirical scrutiny that's brought to bear on income subsidy programs or housing subsidy programs is, is incredible in comparison to the, the uh, evaluation efforts uh, of, of some of the, the urban revitalization programs that have been funded. So I think about this a lot because I studied Sandtown Winchester before um, you know, it, it came in the news as the, um, as the neighborhood um, you know, where Freddie Gray was from because uh, over $130 million was spent on Sandtown Winchester in the 1990s. Uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter came down, um, you know, there was all kinds of fanfare and it was hailed as this incredible investment in our in urban neighborhoods and then after a little while all of the media disappeared and, and nobody bothered to see whether the money made a difference uh, and I think that part of that is because it's it's you know I, I think people have less of a problem if you spend money and, and, and don't move anybody where you just sort of keep people where they are and yeah let's let's you know create some more parks and and make some houses look nice. No one's going to get too upset about that. And so that spending, I think, this is my theory, goes more on, less, is less scrutinized than when individual families are given money and are having to prove that they, it was worth the investment. Um, you know, so I think that we, we definitely have to do a better job figuring out what happens when we invest in place-based strategies. I think it's critically important. Uh, you know, one of the things we've started doing in Baltimore is looking at why abandoned houses are abandoned. Who walks away from properties in our inner cities? It hurts everybody, right? It hurts the homeowners who live there, and this is particularly the case in very vulnerable neighborhoods in East and West Baltimore. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, there was, you know, predatory lending was a huge problem in Baltimore, like many cities, and Wells Fargo was sued, right, um, because of that. You know, so how do we do a better job preserving our city neighborhoods, and not just the gentrifying areas, right? So how do we support the landlords, property owners, and managers who are who are brokering the geography of opportunity on the one hand, but also shoring up the, the you know the skeleton and the, the and the you know the bones and meats of our of our city. So I think we have to uh, uh, take that into consideration in a way that we normally don't, and partly because we don't think about re the renting class is a, a class that's all that important to focus on, right? We 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 give a lot of benefits to homeowners. We focus a lot on owning a home, and a lot less so on renting. Even though more than a third of American households rent. We have very little in the way of rental policy for those families who don't get a Section 8 voucher, which is most. Mm -hmm. Only about one out of four eligible families receives the Section 8 voucher. Right? And, and we know that affordable housing is a huge crisis for everybody and has only gotten worse. Right? I mean, in no, uh, in no state, and actually I think in almost no county in the United States, can a worker working full-time earning, uh, working full-time earning minimum wage can afford a one or two bedroom apartment uh, at the fair market rent. Right, and with wage stagnation, you put these two things together, it, it, it creates huge problems um, and, and perpetuates some of the issues we've been talking about in terms of segregation. But those are some th things I'm thinking about. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we do urban revitalization right? I think part of it is, you know, the less uh, exciting answer is to start building a better research base. And I think the Obama administration has done a much better job, uh, so we will learn a bit more about what happened with choice neighborhoods and promised neighborhoods moving forward uh, than maybe we have in the past. Um, I'll speak to the community part, right? So the narrative around integration has often meant moving black bodies to white spaces, right? We know two things. One, those white spaces have often resisted black bodies. Two, while the black bodies who have moved there have done relatively better, right, it hasn't been this huge boom, right? For me, it means I believe everybody values community, right? Now, I will say when I tend to interview white research subjects and ask them about um, the value of community and whiteness. They're like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> now, now skip that part, trust me, because you see in the suburbs, you see the, the, the wagon circled when there's a threat, so to speak, right. right? So there are ways that communities matter. We have learned how to do a lot of creaming, right? Find the individual kids and move them out, right? I think what Posse did right is moving kids together to schools, but we haven't figured out how to address his dilemma, right? 
because there's a program for your, your kid who you're thinking he shouldn't be here or she shouldn't be here. It may be prep for prep, it may be summer on the hill, it may be uh, you, you know, breakthrough. There's a program for that. The problem is that we have bought into what Moynihan proposed, a period of benign neglect for urban areas because we're more comfortable saying the kid shouldn't be here than this neighborhood should look like this. So we have bought into that so deeply that we can't even begin to say, what are the policy levers we could have about eradicating and challenging concentra concentrated poverty? Right? Hallie mentioned in the beginning that we have more neighborhoods with concentrated poverty. Well, that's a huge problem. So we need more even then, and promised neighborhoods are a good idea, but they are very small-scaled and, and really, let me just say, on the cheap version of what uh, Jeffrey Canada was trying to do a Harlem Children's Zone. Now, the application is a whole different conversation, but I think we need to shift our thinking away from how do we find the folks that, that we can pick and allow them to rise to how do we really invest in communities because folks are going to be there. And the schools that are failing now have been failing for 30 years, so that accumulation of disadvantage has to be disrupted seriously and systematically. And also, yeah. again, you know, to, to follow up on this, we, we put a lot of pressure on schools. Mm -hmm. I know there are some teachers and former teachers in the room, um, you know, and, and I think it, if, if we break down the number of waking hours that young people spend in school by the time they're 18, it's less than 15%. So what about families and communities mm -hmm. and health? You know, so when we think about policy in America, the, the go-to policy for dealing with inequality is education policy, and this makes, it makes a lot of sense. It can be transformative, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, when we think, when we think about that, we're, we're not thinking about a package of, of things together. We're not thinking about how, how, mm -hmm. about how health would do that. Not, not really. Correct. Right? We're not really investing in this larger bundle. You know, we're not really investing in family policy. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're not really thinking about, uh, at least, you know, not, not publicly. The conversation really says, well, how do we you know, and make sure that children achieve. Your first thought isn't, well, are mom and dad employed in the kind of job where they could afford to live in the house they're living in? But we immediately go to, you know, Common Core and teachers. And we spend, you know, and we can argue there may be not enough money to spend on education, but we spend more on that than some of these other, uh, in some of these other policy domains. But yet it's critically important that children are in healthy families in safe neighborhoods, right? So I think there's certainly a balance in that conversation that tends to, you know, to favor um, education-only approaches and um, that maybe we're thinking about a little more broadly. Well, I know that we are the only things standing in between you and a drink and some food and conversation. <laughs> um, but let me just say that, you know, uh, one of the things that I know we were thinking about here at Century heading into this conversation is we realized, oh man, did we really frame a real downer here that, um, you know, we're just talking about, I think, some of the most persistent problems that plague our country and our society. Um, but. I feel a lot of hope in the work that you are doing and in the crowd that we have in this room um, and in the fact that um, I think there are people who are interested in the intersections between housing and education and realizing that we need to look at these things together and come up with solutions that really think about how we change things as a whole and um, aren't thinking so much in silos. Um, so for me, that does give hope, even though um, we have so far that we still need to come. I know there were some questions that we didn't get a chance to uh, get to. We are staying, and I hope that you will come up to panelists or uh, find us um, with a drink and some snacks outside and just continue this conversation. So thank you again so much for coming, and I am... I hand it over to, to Kristen to give us a little closing and some instructions. Yeah, uh, well, let's give Hallie, LaRue, and Stephanie another round of applause. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm the higher education policy intern here at the Century Foundation. Thank you all again for coming out today. Um, this is actually the last event of the summer, as Yvette said earlier. And for those of you who are here for the first time, um, we had two great discussions earlier this month on phone encryption with TCF's Bart Gelman and Alex Abdo uh, from the American Civil Liberties Union, and one on the modern labor movement with TCF senior fellow Rick Collenberg, the nation's Michelle Chen, and Michelle Miller, co-founder of coworker.org. 
Um, you can actually view the full webcast of those events as well as today's discussion online at our website. Um, and if you want to stay in the loop on future events hosted by TCF, please sign up for a newsletter at tcf.org. Uh, so we invite you now all to stay, have some refreshments in the back, and mingle. And thank you again. <laughs>